In the late 1960s, scientists in Sweden were studying a phenomenon which was puzzling them. In often remote lakes, there was an unexplained die-off of aquatic life in lakes. They established for the first time a link between atmospheric pollution and the possibility that the acidification of rain could result in this phenomenon. This program is about acid deposition. First of all, rain is naturally acidified. As it passes through banks of carbon dioxide, it can mix with that carbon dioxide to produce carbonic acid. Carbon dioxide has the ability to bond with a hydrogen bond to water. At first, this might seem a little bit puzzling because carbon dioxide is a nonpolar molecule, but the unbonded pairs of electrons that exist at the end of the oxygen atom, those can bond essentially with the positively charged hydrogen that's present in water. And that's indicated in my diagram off here on the right. Further rearrangement can ultimately lead to carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is a weak acid, meaning that it doesn't dissociate very readily. And there's the reaction for it. Now, this naturally makes rain somewhat acidic. Usually it has a pH of around 5. But acid rain was the first of acidified um, deposition to be studied. It's now become much broader than just acid rain. First of all, we now use the word acid deposition. Acid deposition can come in two forms. It can either be wet or dry deposition. Acid rain falling into the wet deposition category. But we can get other forms of precipitation that are also acidified, including snow, rain, sleet, hail, drizzle, fog. And also now we can get acidification through dry deposition. Acid particles that are present adhering to smoke or dust, and the gases themselves can be acidic in nature, requiring, uh, not requiring then the presence of the rain to cause their damage. Of particular interest are nitrogen oxides and sulfur oxides. Let's look at how these enter our environment. First of all, whenever air is used to combust a fuel, the nitrogen that's present in air, which makes up about 90% of air, itself can combine with oxygen to produce nitrous oxides. And here's an example of two such reactions. The nitrogen can combine with one oxygen to produce nitrogen monoxide, or with two oxygens to produce nitrogen dioxide. Now, when nitrogen dioxide combines with water, we can essentially produce two forms of acids. The first acid is called nitrous acid. It's a somewhat weak acid. And the second one, nitric acid, is a much stronger acid. In fact, nitrous acid can be converted to nitric acid in the environment as well, with the addition of oxygen. Sulfur oxides enter the environment in a different manner. Basically, the combustion of sulfur-bearing fuels releases sulfur oxides. So, for instance, the combustion of coal. Coal can contain anywhere between 1 to 7 percent sulfur that's in it. So when sulfur and oxygen combine, they produce sulfur dioxide. That can then mix with water to produce the weak acid, sulfurous acid. But it's also possible for sulfur dioxide to be converted in our atmosphere and in UV light to the presence of sulfur trioxide. When that combines with water, we produce sulfuric acid, a much stronger acid. The effects of this acid deposition are, are quite noticeable. First of all, they can have an impact on building materials, such as limestones and many metals. For instance, here we can see a, an aged sculpture that essentially was made of limestone, and that limestone has reacted with the acid uh, precipitation. So here's an example of the wet reaction that might be taking place. The sulfuric acid present in the rain reacts with calcium carbonate. We know that from carbonates we produce carbon dioxide and water, and a salt, in this case calcium sulfate. We can also get a dry reaction happening. In this case, sulfur dioxide gas plus oxygen in the presence of light can react directly with the calcium carbonate to produce calcium sulfate and carbon dioxide. We also have the effects of acid deposition on plant life. What essentially acids do is they make minerals, minerals more soluble in water, in particular magnesium. So in this particular picture off on the right hand side, we can see the removal of needles, needles needing magnesium to produce chlorophyll. The leaching and removing of magnesium ions from the environment essentially has killed this forest. 
This process of removing minerals by sort of washing them away is called leaching. There also could be an effect, as seen earlier, on aquatic life. Acidification of, of rock materials can release aluminum ions that are trapped in that rock. Aluminum ions are particularly corrosive to fish gills, causing you to die off of fish. Nitric acid can actually act as a fertilizer and promote the growth of algae in lakes, leading to a condition called eutrophication. Perhaps you've seen it sometimes called an algal bloom. And we also have the effects on humans. Eye irritation, irritation of the linings of the lungs and breathing lead to asthma and bronchitis. There's a couple of things we can do uh, to respond to this threat. First of all, let's look at what we can do about sulfur oxides. One of the techniques that's being employed is to scrub the fuel before it's burned, essentially using a technique called flotation. You pulverize the coal into a powder, add surfactants to the material and bubble air through it. And this is a physical separation whereby if the sulfur is not chemically bonded to the coal, the sulfur deposits will essentially settle on the bottom and the coal rise to the top, thereby removing some of the sulfur that's present in our coal. After we burn the coal, we can also look at removing sulfur dioxide through a technique called scrubbing, whereby we take the sulfur dioxide and mix it with calcium oxide to produce a solid calcium sulfite. To reduce nitrogen oxide emissions, um, one of the things we've responded with is the use of the catalytic converter, which can take carbon monoxide and nitrogen oxide and turn it back into elemental nitrogen, thereby removing that component from our acid rain. If we can combust at lower temperatures, we can reduce the production of nitrogen oxide. We can see here from this reaction that the reaction is an endothermic reaction. So the addition of heat drives the reaction forward. If I reduce the heat, I drive the reaction in reverse. So again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to post them. And thanks again for watching.